All right, welcome to episode three of In Sagatio Sapientiae. As always, your co host, Zachary. Shout out to the people. You got anything? Peace. Keep looking for knowledge. There it is. And eat more chicken. <laughs> always eating more chicken. And our special guest this week is Grant Russell. He is top three all time. <laughs> Just in general. <laughs> it's a large list. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, for people who don't know, um, we used to all live together. And then everyone decided to get married and, and I'm just here now. So, <laughs> But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about like where you grew up, what that was like for you? For sure. I uh, grew up in Sandy, Utah, um, to a pretty conservative family, a uh, big family. There's uh, seven kids, so six siblings. Um, I was on the later end of it, so my parents were pretty tired by the time they got to me, and things were pretty lax, which was nice. Um, but yeah, just went through a pretty normal Utah upbringing. Went to Utah State, um, served a two-year um mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and came back, did a degree in computer science um, and I've worked in, so I have worked in software development ever since uh, about starting my career in about 2018, the beginning of the year. So um, just kind of a budding software developer, hoping to grow a career in that. And then um, as far as like hobbies and free time, definitely love Playing video games, PC gaming, it's definitely a big hobby of mine. Um, but as well as like a lot of outdoor activities, so rock climbing, snowboarding. Um, I love outdoor rec leagues, anything that gets me running. Nice. Now, um, we like to go into a little bit of your religious history. So, what was like deciding to serve a mission like for you? Did you feel like you were obligated? With having older brothers or was it a little bit different for you being the younger one what was that like no yeah it uh it definitely felt like an obligation i think it's hard to convince an 18 year old that they need to put their life behind them and uh do something as selfless as serving a mission um because that's a, a time in at least in my life where i was pretty s focused about myself but um, the sense of duty kind of got to me a little bit more than any sort of calling to serve, I think, um, or desire to, but because my brothers did it, I think was a big uh, reason why I went in to do it. Um, but as I would say, I would think a lot of missionaries experience, I feel like my motivations and, and that dramatically shifted once I actually got out onto the mission. Um, there's always like a growing process and it's, inherently like a pretty difficult thing to do and so i feel like it kind of puts you through a trial by fire almost and it's a it's a pretty intense challenge and you kind of have to come to grips with some some of the experiences and stuff like that but i feel like um the longer i was out the more i was there because i wanted to be and um the less i was there out of a sense of duty where i legitimately started to enjoy it and i saw the benefits of kind of forgetting um myself as an individual and, and trying to serve as much as possible um, and help others as much as possible. And I think um, that was a huge turning point for me in my life as well. Before, previously, I was doing very poorly in school and, and didn't find a lot of focus or priority in that. And I definitely feel like, um, yeah, the, the perspective that something like that gave me a, a mission uh, changed a lot of how I viewed life and and yeah everything like that so Is, was there any like <clears throat> any specific moment that you recall from your mission that was like where that tide began to change you could say like where it was more like it was a duty initially and then your motivation started to change was there like any specific moment that you remember feeling that start that change occurring in you yeah um interestingly enough i think it was um how long was i i think it was like four and a half months in um i was feeling pretty bad for myself i 
just like in general, wasn't enjoying a lot of what had gone up into those first three months that I wasn't super comfortable with um, how I was being trained. And it just felt kind of like an, in, yeah, it was just like a growth period and it was uncomfortable for me and I, I wasn't enjoying it personally, but about four and a half months in, I got put into like a leadership position where I needed to now train an, another missionary on how to do missionary work. And I mean, anyone can tell you like four and a half months into a job, you still never feel like you're, you're on top of your game or like, you know, anything. Um, and so that was like a huge moment for me where I, I kind of realized like, I need to step this up. Like I'm, it was kind of like a, a do or die moment where it felt like I could either decide to just take this completely lax or I can do my best and kind of forget myself and stop feeling bad about myself. Um, and I feel like that leadership opportunity to help a, another missionary be trained was, was crucial for me because it kind of folk, it brought the focus, I think, off of me and onto to helping him because I didn't want him to have a bad experience and I wanted him to, to grow as much as possible. And so I think that kind of was what it came down to. Um, it's kind of that, that shift from thinking like, oh, woe is me to, hey, how can I help this this person, even if it was just my the companion that I was with at the time, that missionary, um, but that slowly grew, and I feel like that was the shift that I was like helping my companion, and and then helping the the other missionaries even outside of my companionship, and then helping the people, and it kind of grew from there. Nice, that's awesome. Yeah, that really goes in with what you were saying. Like, you know, going on a mission really is like a selfless act, and you got to experience that by being less selfish. It it, it became uh, or less selfish, more selfless. Um, yeah. yeah helped yeah. you grow in, into that spiritual experience kind of reminds me of a i don't have the exact quote but uh, Brigham young talked about bearing testimony and he said that a man will find his testimony more often in bearing it than in hearing it and that it's really interacting with the gospel that gives those strengthening experiences yeah i i definitely think that's the case too it it was funny because up until that point, uh, up until the point where I left on my mission, I definitely think that was the case where I, I hadn't interacted with the gospel as much as I could have. And and getting that experience to go out and actually live it and share it. And like you said, bear, like bearing your testimony about it was what actually gave me the experiences that gave me a confirmation of its truthfulness. Um it's i think of it always as like um comparing it to like a muscle or like a, a workout regime like there's no way that you can know if a specific workout is going to work for you unless you actually act on it and you um yeah get into the flow and, and start trying to build up your muscles through it there's um such a a powerful experience that comes through personally living it and working through it so i i've always i definitely agree with that do you feel like there was ever like a moment that you had like a, a struggle with the gospel or maybe had like a question and what was that like when you approached that? Did, were you able to overcome it? What was something along those lines? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. As far as like individual concerns, I feel like they always just get swallowed up in the testimony that I, that uh, grew from my mission. So just the experiences that I enjoyed and the spirits, the spirit that I felt, it was all of that kind of like, it, it's hard to, when you have a strong base, it's hard to, for that to be shaken by the little questions that I, without a doubt, everybody has. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if there's ever been like a specific topic or anything that has specifically, tried, that's like sh uh, shaken me and, and made me doubt. Um, just because every time I just kind of come back to, to those experiences and to what I've experienced in the past. And it's uh, easier to, to rely on, on those rather than what I think I've determined for myself, I guess. For sure. Kind of reminds me of a little story. I don't know if, uh, where it comes from necessarily, but like a kid was asking their grandparent, you know, hey, grandpa, why do you read the Bible so often? And so he's like, hey, uh, go grab that basket over there that like, holds like the fire poker and uh, the bellows and everything. And go mm -hmm. to the, down to the river and bring me back the bucket full. So the kid goes, brings it back. And every time he notices, oh, I'm losing water the whole way back up. And he goes back three or four times. And then he's like, 
Grandpa, I can't bring the water back in this thing. Yes, but look at how clean the basket is. And really, like, those experiences you have really change you as a person. Whether or not you, like, you retain every piece of information from the experience um, really opens you up to mm-hmm. having a stronger faith. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I mean... I totally agree on on that topic as well. I think that that's kind of the whole purpose of what we're doing here. And like to branch on that, um, Grant, to you, like this is kind of where we're heading next. What does it mean to be well-rounded? Like the phrase of a well-rounded person or, or, you know, a renaissance man, if you want to use uh, the terminology that way. But what, what does that mean to you? Yeah. I mean, everything comes in balance. Um, especially in life. I mean, having recently graduated, um, I got married, started a new job. Um, all of these things kind of came pretty, pretty quickly. And especially now maintaining responsibilities as a husband, as a professional, um, anyone who's started a career knows that there's, you, you can go too far. Like you can, you can be overly dedicated or you could be um, too focused on that and let other parts of your life and relationships fall apart. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely think that being a well-rounded person means understanding um, where to draw the line in certain areas of your life and understanding that you're not, you're never going to be um, perfect in every aspect of your life and that you, you have to make sure that you keep things in balance so that you um, yeah, you, you keep a, basically just a healthy environment around you. Um, if I work too late on an, uh, during a, a night of the week, then um, that can sometimes end up hurting a relationship with my, my wife. Or if I never make plans with friends, um, I can start losing friendships if, if I just wanted to stay home and only focus on my, my wife and my career. So I think um, all of these areas, though, definitely help you and give you like a, a support and make you a person well-rounded like you guys talked about but um it's i feel like it's all about the individual and deciding which areas are important to them and making sure that they dedicate that time that's good we were talking about like which subjects we'd want to talk about with you um yeah, i kind of yeah. came to the conclusion that talking about being a well-rounded person fit really well with you because i was like <laughs> what is what is grant interested in and i was like of course he's interested into like pc gaming like you said but, you know, you also play the guitar. You try to learn songs in your free time. You're into, uh, you know, Ultimate Frisbee. You're into climbing and all these different things, um, snowboarding. Um, but one of my right. questions was, like, what, what helped you, like, decide to pick each of those different things? Like, do you just, like, haven't have friends that were doing it? What, what kind of led you into those? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I honestly think a lot of my motivation into getting into different aspects uh, or into like different hobbies and, and different areas is, uh, is pretty socially motivated. Um, I mean, thinking back, like the reason I got into snowboarding was because all of my brothers snowboarded and it was a way for me to, to get in, um, yeah, to get in with them and, and spend time with them. The reason I got into ultimate Frisbee, two of my friends in high school had joined the team a year before me and it looked like fun. And they talked about their experiences and I was like, that, that sounds great. I want to join a team. Um, guitar. I joined, <laughs> a, I took a guitar class because a cute girl at my high school told me that she was taking the guitar class and that I should take it for, with her. So I was like, so all, I feel like a lot of my motivations around certain areas like this are socially motivated where I, I just love spending time with people that are around me and the people that I want to to be with. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of those situations, it was just because I wanted to to be with those people and, and spend more time with them. Um, as far as I feel like maybe an exception to that is PC gaming. The other thing that I feel like uh, attracts me to different areas is just things that um, give me like a, a sense of worth or a sense of purpose. I feel like a lot of people do that where if you're good at something, you tend to be drawn towards it and and do it more. And I think like being a software developer, I've always been, ever since I was a little kid, really interested in computers. And especially at a, a young age, like I would was playing StarCraft with 
my older brothers when I was probably like nine or 10 years old, just like at a pretty young age, always wanting to be into gaming. Um, and because it's something that I feel like I, I'm good at and I get a lot of um, enjoyment out of, it's something that I return back to just because it, it kind of gives me a little bit of that sense of worth of like, I'm, I'm good at this thing, so I, I like to do it, so. Was that kind of similar for you, Zach? Do you feel like you were more socially motivated when you choose a, a hobby or whatnot? Yeah, I think I really like what Grant said, honestly. I think that that's um, a good summary of it. I think it comes down to social, um, your your social circles, and then also, you know, the things you're good at. It's it's kind of fun to do those things because you get a sense of worth out of it. The one other thing that – the one other – I don't know if I'd call it quite a caveat, but like um, the one other like perspective I would give to that also is from like a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, us as humans, as, as men, we have an innate desire to conquer, <laughs> you know, like that's part of who we are. And, you know, I mean, I get that some people don't feel that way, but I feel like a lot of guys do. And that's why you see toxic masculinity and things like that. But that's why one of like my hobbies that I've been really drawn to lately has been archery, because there's something that just it satiates my hunger to go out there and like kill something, you know, it's so fun to like try and like best an animal and be like, we're, you know, like I did that as a man and I provided meat for my family, you know, it's kind of cool. It's, it's so it's like, that's the one other thing that I would say in, in like my personal life, the things that have motivated me, it's mostly social cues or social circles. I mean, like that's why I got more into PC gaming was because I wanted to spend more time with you guys, honestly, <laughs> and, right. you know, they're <laughs> exactly like, honestly. And so like there, there, there are things like that social circles. And then like baseball for me was always one of those things that I was good at. I had a good time with it. So I wanted to play it more. But that's one of the things that I've seen more recently as I've been growing up and finding other hobbies to do is there's something about conquering something that feels so good. I feel that way when I rock climb too, when I conquer a big wall or, you know, a hard totally. route that I haven't been able to get. It's it's this powerful feeling of I did that, you know, I bested it. So right. I think there's so much I don't and I don't know why uh, we're so motivated by this, but I feel like there's there's such a motivation around um like a, a hard challenge or a complex problem anything like that versus like successfully overcoming it um i feel like with almost any video game if it's worth its weight there's there's a challenge to overcome and um a sense of enjoyment and like a sense of reward uh, overcoming that challenge and i think that's something that's definitely motivated me um but i kind of like what you, you were saying though zach it's i feel like it's a balance of those two things like one to to be successful and to to yeah, kind of overcome it. And then the other thing is like, we're very tribalistic as humans, I feel like. And um, uh, like uh, as a PC gamer, a lot of my family always makes fun of me saying like, or pretty as if I were condescending to them for playing different uh, like consoles or anything like that. But if anyone ever asks me like, what what's the best console to get? Or like, what should I get? I always will say like, what are your friends playing? Like who, who do you want to play with? Because I feel like, um, time and time again, I will get sick of a game or sick of um, playing on a console by myself. And what always brings me back to it is the friends that I'm playing with. So if I have friends playing on PC, then I'm definitely going to play PC. If my, my brothers are playing on Xbox, then I'll definitely try to play on Xbox as well. I feel like it's, uh, in a lot of cases, it's less about how you play the game and more about who you're playing with and, and kind of what you're playing. And I think... Um, those two areas are, are uh, super important to me and what I think always kind of bring me back to it. So, All right. And for me, like a big part of being so well-rounded and having those different groups you can go to is making sure you're not cutting off opportunities for yourself. Uh, when I moved up to Utah, you know, I played football and then I had, you know, football friends and then I started doing the academic league and then I had my academic friends and then I had my basketball friends, and my baseball friends. And, you know, at any good time, like if I needed – back up from a certain way I could go to that group and you know get that kind of support right and I also I hate being like just like simplified like one thing like oh Jesse just likes Oreos baseball and, and games that's it 
<laughs> yeah. Like, Wait, you <laughs> like more than that? <laughs> I like Chick Fil A and Coca Cola. It's at least two more things. <laughs> well rounded. Right. No, definitely. And the the other thing is like we are we're so complex as human beings as far as like from day to day we we can wear so many hats and there's days where um games and and pc gaming sounds like the most fun thing in the world and there's days where like i just couldn't be bothered to even turn on my computer and and try to sit down so i think being well-rounded helps you on those days where if you're a one facet type of person where there's really only one thing that you come back to and that you go to invariably that thing won't give you enjoyment on certain days and in those cases it's so important to have different outreaches and different ways to express yourself um just because we wear those different hats and there's yeah there's just no way that one thing can give you infinite enjoyment for sure so i wanted to move into uh, kind of talking about the last um article we did on the blog which is De Rega Ligai, the King of League, which is maybe a over the top title for our man uh, Bjergsen, who retired this week. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to read it or not, but uh, basically I just went through and talked about like Bjergsen's story, how he was like super bullied as a as a kid in in Denmark, and found his escape from school and from all the bullying in league and kind of turned that into talking about a little bit what we talked about before, like how great it is overcoming such great obstacles and how we view our heroes as as doing that kind of thing. Right. Comparing that to other sports heroes as well. So if you want to talk um, about what got you into um, maybe TSM first, or if you want to talk about Bjergsen and, because you were the influence to get me to be a TSM fan, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, being totally honest to the roots, so I got into League of Legends around 2011 or so. Um, just my, my brother-in-law, he had told me about it, and he said that he thought I'd probably be good at it because I had played a bunch of Warcraft and Starcraft and uh he's like it's similar but i think you'd like it he i'd never really played dota which is what league of legends um kind of was based off of obviously but uh getting into it i really enjoyed the game i started to to play it more and more and as i made friends and even made friends in in high school who who played the game as well um i noticed that they would watch other players and professionals play and Originally, I was watching a player named Dyrus, who was just really good. He wasn't on any team. Um, esports leagues were, or esports teams weren't like even super big back then. But um, I watched him a lot, and he played uh, a role in the game that I personally enjoyed to play uh, as well. And so he kind of became a little bit of an inspiration for me. Um, and then that was when he joined what is now TSM and started playing professionally. And, um, at that point, I just became a fan of the organization just because, one, I was a huge fan of Dyrus, and then the other is because they were really good. They just kept winning, and they seemed to be uh, really dominant, especially early on in their in the organization's history. But um, after I left on that two-year mission and came back, Bjergsen had joined the team. Um, and it was, it was really cool, actually, to see just because um, it seemed like the LCS and where uh, teams like TSM played were were dominated by old guard, um, just players who had been playing for so long and had a lot of experience. It was crazy to see this like insanely young kid join and take over for Reginald, who was the the, the previous mid laner that TSM had. Um, especially watching, and I had known Reginald this whole time and known how he played. It was like, how could someone replace that? Like, it's going to be hard, um, <laughs> which is pretty funny knowing now yeah, what Bjergsen has become yeah exactly i was pretty skeptical i was like oh here we go tsn's like bring in some random kid and um man he just proved me wrong time and time again he, he became the focal point of the team and i mean it's you talk to anybody who's watched league of legends or any of the professionals who's who've played with him and they have nothing but respect for the guy he's he's so hard working he's 
um, rarely negative um, towards other players or or situations. Like he owns up to to mistakes. It's it's such a cool um, inspiration to have as far as Lee goes because he he treats um, the game in a way that uh, I really respect, which is even though it is a team game, you always have your own personal mistakes and your own um, things to work on. And he takes full responsibility for those things and, and does as best as he can with it, which is uh, pretty inspiring, to be honest. Um, I feel like I should ask this question, even though um, <laughs> there's... Just for the viewer's sake, maybe there's a couple that aren't into video games or watching um, professional esports, because this is a conversation that I remember having with you a while ago, probably when we were first living together for getting to know each other, you and I, Grant. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't ever against esports, but you brought a new light to my eyes about it, and I just wanted you to like kind of reiterate what you said about how the comparison between esports and like professional baseball, basketball, soccer, whatever, you know, because people sometimes look down on esports and they say, oh, you're just watching some dude play a video game. That's weird. But, you right. know, I kind of wanted you to share a little bit from that perspective that you shared with me because, it, you know, I mean, I was never against it, but you opened up my eyes even more to why it's such an intriguing thing, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you can you can ask anybody who's not even into sports. So uh, as far as like a, a good comparison, I feel like for people who are fans of uh, leagues like the NFL and the NBA, you've more than likely met someone who's not a fan of those leagues. And you trying to explain like your excitement about it or um, like the awe of some of the talent of of really amazing players, it's kind of it kind of gets lost on them just because it there's a there's a translation layer that doesn't quite click as far as um, not understanding or not really knowing. But yeah, I think I remember kind of talking to you about that in the past, and um, I I think that the the connections to like normal sports, it I mean it's so funny because. Uh, streams and watching people play video games is, is pretty popular these days and a lot a lot of people may scratch their heads at that like why in a in a world where everyone has a, a pc why would you ever um watch someone play a video game rather than just play the video game yourself and i i think i the connection i made was like why would you ever watch someone play football instead of just playing football yourself like what the why would why wouldn't you go to just play in the nfl if that's some if you like football Right. So mm -hmm. there's there's something about watching a higher level of play that is just so intrinsically entertaining, especially if you at a base level know how the game is played to watch it be executed so well at such a high level by players who have just completely dedicated their lives to to perfecting the game. Yeah, I feel like the the mode of of sport is different for sure. It's not as physical, but the level of respect that I have for some of the players and the level at which they play, I feel is absolutely no different. Um, and it's something that, yeah, I, I think, it, especially if you don't come from a background where you don't understand how the game is played, I think a lot of times it can be lost in translation. It's not something very entertaining, but um, yeah, it, it it absolutely comes down to maybe understanding the basics of the game. Um, but in in many ways, it's just absolutely similar to watching someone else play in the NFL or, or playing the NBA. So, yeah, I was definitely one of those skeptics when we started out. I was like, my little brother would watch um, YouTubers play Minecraft and like show them how to build stuff and stuff. Like, you can just go do it. Just go play <laughs> Minecraft. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I started playing League, um, and uh, I watched a couple of streamers. Like, whoa, you could you could do that in the game. Whoa, I never Minecraft. thought about doing that. And you watch a couple of videos and like you get better and better and you're like, oh, okay, all right. And at this point, I actually, I watch LCS more than I watch the MLB or the NBA. Um, a lot of that has to do with Bjergsen. So it's going to be weird this year without him there. But I was always like, um, he was like the sole identity of the team because he stayed there longer and everyone kept switching out. I was like, I started to become questioning if I was a Bjergsen fan or if I was a, a TSM <laughs> fan. Which I think, mm -hmm. um, surprisingly, a lot of people um, felt as well. And a good comparison would be like when Brady went to Tampa Bay this year. Um, how many of the Patriots fans followed him to Tampa Bay 
Or like when LeBron leaves, how many people follow LeBron as a fan rather than sticking with the Cavs or right. whatever? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah I remember. Yeah. I remember asking you that question, Jesse. <laughs> I remember saying, "If you're a team, like I, I knew that he had just got locked into a huge contract, but I was like, just hypothetically, let's say." <laughs> Bjergsen goes to like Cloud Nine or something. Do you become a Cloud Nine fan? <laughs> it was a it was a debate for you. You had to yeah. think about it. You know, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think uh, I don't know uh, loyalty to a team. Um, I feel like always has to be taken with like a grain of salt, mostly because teams it's kind of like i don't know this this is what it makes me think of i don't know if it, it's super late but it's like if you replace every part of a boat over the course of 10 years is it the same boat or is it a completely new boat um and i feel like loyalty to a team to a certain extent um should be questioned and should be held in <laughs> like if the team isn't representing like your values or if none of the players are really players that you enjoy watching um then I, I absolutely think that you should question which team that it is that you're enjoying. Because I feel like it's more about the individuals that you relate to. Like um, like you said, LeBron or Michael Jordan. As kids playing basketball these days, they, I absolutely would choose a player that they like want to try to model themselves after and, and try to be as good as. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think just because we, we want to relate to the professionals and, and try to be like them, I feel like a lot of my loyalty does come down to like um following players and and liking players um more than it being like absolute loyalty to the organization so yeah yeah like, being a kid uh playing baseball um just like in the house be like oh i'm our pools up to bat oh now i'm barry bonds up to bat now i'm craig bidju up to bat and they're all from yeah. different teams but you like you do their stance you you try to be exactly like them yeah definitely I think, like, for me, what's funny about that is um, my whole life I always grew up saying I was a Mets fan, and I knew about the other big players, and I thought they were cool. You know, you you always had, like, a respect for those players, Barry Bonds, Pujols, all those guys. But then, like, I always was very narrow-minded. Like, the Mets are my team, you know? The Mets are my team. And I still love the Mets, and I still will root for them all the time. But now I have a lot more enjoyment just going – through the games and going like, oh, this dude's going to pitch today. I'm going to watch that random Mariners game because I want to watch him pitch. And so it's like more about like Grant was saying earlier, how perfect some of those players can be. And it's fun to watch how well they can execute their, their sport, you know, and it becomes less, you know, it's more about like those players specifically, your connection to them, maybe just the admiration for like their skill level, like in LeBron James, I would always love to watch a LeBron James game because the man is a master on the court, you know? So I agree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Another big thing that is like so impressive about LeBron specifically is his longevity in the league. He's dominated for what? This is his 17th season. And there hasn't mm -hmm. really been a single one that stands out like he didn't like shine as a star. Mm -hmm. And coming back again, Bjergsen's career is what? Seven, eight years. But yeah. for a esports player, that's a pretty long career. And for how oh, how dominant he was through that, so you want to give us a little bit more perspective on like why it's so competitive and why there's so much turnover when it comes to esports players. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a topic that really interests me because um, one thing that does differ from esports from a regular sport is um, a term called like the meta of the game. So, in terms of like basketball. Um, the meta of the game right now has shifted more towards something like uh, three-point shooters and, and taking um, high percentage shots rather than um, taking like some high risk shots or, or really kind of like medium of the court uh, game. So I, the way that I think of that is uh, it, it's, it's just interesting to me how it slowly shifts. In regular sports, it feels like these changes of like how the game is played. If you look, if you were to try to compare to how players played the NFL in the 50s versus how they're playing um, in modern day, it would be a complete shift just because the um, what the the style of the game has has changed. The thing about esports, though, and specifically, I get, I would say League of Legends, is that the meta is constantly shifting. It is 
inherently like even from um month to month certain things can change and how the game is played is is has completely shifted so it's inherently a really hard target to hit um versus something like a, a yeah like a regular sport to um to have a more slow shift towards this so the that's the one thing that is really amazing about some um esport athletes is even with um a constantly shifting meta where so say for example you're in the nba and you're an amazing three-point shooter you can hit super high percentage shots all day long um but now the game the game's meta has shifted more towards like no you need to be able to drive in and get it to the basket as close as possible and that's just not one of your strengths you're going to slowly be um pulled out as a player that that's just not something that you're going to be good at um and you wouldn't be able to perform and that's exactly what happens in in league of legends that as the meta shifts um certain roles become really difficult to play because you need to be a master of everything like you you can't be um to use a phrase like a one-trick pony you can't be good at just this one thing and be able to think that you could get a career out of it because you need to be such a uh, well-rounded player <laughs> and uh you need to have a lot of, of of talent in different metas and and know how to adapt and shift and that's why you see so many professional esport athletes have a career of like less than a year almost or it's it is pretty rare for esport athletes to have like these long seasoned careers just because of how constant that shift is and how hard it is to hit the target with the meta every single month from yeah even day to day so yeah and that meta is hard enough to hit when you're playing against everyone that's in north america but then you take it to an international tournament and everyone else's meta is slightly different to like the chinese server they'll play a lot more aggressively early and give up some of like the later game power that they would normally have and you have to adapt to that while they're also adapted to the way you play and it's just a big jumbled mess of everyone trying to guess what's going to be the best fit to play yeah yeah exactly um, but bringing it back to Bjergsen, th- that's why I feel like his career is um, is so incredible and, and so unique compared to other players is because even as meta shifts, because there are, to, to the credit of the LCS, there are other players who have been in the league very a, a super long time as well and um, have been close to the same amount of years as Bjergsen. The, I feel like what brings Bjergsen above the rest, though, is how successful his team has been from year to year. Because it's one thing to be in the league, and it's another thing to be winning in the league. And um, without a doubt, Bjergsen has brought more success to TSM than any other individual player has brought to their organizations. And to the thing that differs from him is not even being able to to play in all these metas, but to be able to win in all these metas is like is another an entire other level. I feel like that is just an incredible to watch and and i mean you look at there's there's probably like 138 champions or something a pretty high number in league of legends that you can play which is turns into a lot of options but you look at the number of champions that bjergsen has played um in professional league and it's insanely high like it's probably close to 70 or 80 which shows you kind of like how how much skill he has because most players would try to focus on maybe 10 or so champions just because it's easy to focus and get good at those but he has such a a a wide pool of options as far as like being able to to shift and do whatever his team needs in order to win cool so like i said in the post i consider bjergsen to be kind of like a like a hero figure for me he's someone i really admire what would you say like how do you view someone becoming a hero like what does it take for them to become a, a hero for you yeah that's a great question <laughs> um i don't know that it feels like for pe- for a person for me to look up to an individual especially in league of legends um more than just like being a skilled player and th- i feel like this reaches out even outside of league of legends like as i follow regular sports for me to be a fan of the of the player, I almost um, prefer to be a fan of them as a person before them as a player. Um, individuals who kind of come off as arrogant or cocky have never I've never really been drawn 
um, to them as far as like being a fan and, and being a, a pretty devout follower of them. So I feel like a lot of where that comes from is like their character and like who, how, um, yeah, like how they choose to behave and, and stuff like that outside of the game. Um, but then inside of the game, I feel like it's players who match the same play style that I have. Um, like another um, hero that I had outside of Bjergsen uh, was a player named Hanser. Um, who played the same role as me. He played a lot of the same style as me. And he had a pretty quiet demeanor and and focused pretty strongly on the game. And it, it was always something that was really impressive to me. And, and um, he never came off as like overly arrogant or cocky. Um, so yeah, it, it just kind of depends. It, it's For me, I feel like a lot of it comes outside of the game because a lot of players are very talented and it's it's easy to recognize that. But when they come off as arrogant or cocky or or just like obnoxious, I, I find it so hard to become a fan of them versus a player who's humble, um, who tries hard and, and is successful in that. So um, so I'll give you an example for me and then I'll ask you too um, if you've had an experience like this. But like one of the heroes I had was Alex Rodriguez. Um, had the chance to be arguably the best player in baseball history. But so much stuff off the field and even some stuff that he did on the field um, like he got caught using steroids and had lied about it. He cheated on his wife and got caught doing that as well. And, you know, all these things, they sort of add up or like, um, got into a lot of fights with the Red Sox that were entirely his fault. And it's like, I wanted him so badly to be my favorite player, but I, I kept losing excuses for why he should be, especially when there are other players that were just as talented, like Ken Griffey Jr. I've come to recognize as arguably the best player of all time for me. Um, but have either of you two had, you know, similar experiences where like you had a hero, but something makes them falter and what that was like. I'm trying to think right now. I was, as we were talking, as you were talking about that, the one on the flip side of that, real quick, is David Wright for me. I compared David Wright to Bjergsen. He was the Mets' Bjergsen. An amazing player, phenomenal, did everything that you wanted him to, and off the, off the field was just an amazing dude. So he was always, like, my, my idol, the one that I always – he was the guy that I would always copy his batting stance, and, you know, it was – that was, like, my, my favorite dude. And, you know, it was, it was good – as I got older and I started to care more about those things, like you were saying about the off the field stuff, um, it was good because I saw him be a great person off the field too. He's, you know, just a great dude. So um, that was just kind of one of those thoughts that was coming to my head while you were talking. I need to come up with a, with an example, a counter example, you know, the hero that failed me <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. And while you're thinking about that, not that I have a specific example either, but I mean, you always hear that phrase, like never meet your heroes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I feel like at a certain level, we like to idealize people and, and hold them up to like this amazingly high standard. But um, I can guarantee that people like Bjergsen or people like Hanser have done things that I would absolutely be appalled by or not, not appalled, but you know what I mean? Like that wouldn't, it wasn't something that I would relate to or, or necessarily agree with. And I think that's true uh, of of all things, of all people and, and all idols and heroes. And at a certain level, like they maybe they are better at something than than you are. But um, I guarantee that there's individual stuff about us that uh, we perform better than than players like them. So I, I, not not to hold them at like a higher standard, because like they say, like never meet your heroes because they're always, they're never going to live up to that, that incredibly high standard. Um, so I feel like it's important when we, um, while we idolize these people and, and uh, look after them in a lot of ways, we have to take it with a grain of salt and make sure that we're not um, allowing their shortcomings to be accepted by us or to, to let them kind of affect us in, in that way, because at the end of the day, they're still human beings. They still make mistakes constantly. And um, we can't let that be a reason to either not follow them as a hero or not look up to them, but also to, yeah, not let the their behavior affect us as well. Yeah, true. I think uh, another couple people I was thinking about was 
is uh, when I got news in 2008 about a certain uh, R&B singer. That, <laughs> that was a rough day. <laughs> that was a rough day. Um, I would say um, I, I thought about a good one for me. A good one that I... And it's funny because I'm not entirely sure that this is... He's like in gray area right now, okay? I'll I'll share his name and you guys will have your uh, your opinions on it. If you if you follow cycling, I don't even know if you follow cycling. I'm big into Tour de France. My family, we love it. We watch it every year. July every morning, the month of July, we're watching the races every day. So, big Tour de France fan. I think you guys know where I'm going now. Lance Armstrong was was our dude, right? Everybody in America was so stoked because an American was absolutely dominating the Tour de France. It was awesome. And not only was he dominating, he had come back from, like, brain cancer, you know? And so um, he was just the guy, you know? It was like, man, he is so cool. He can overcome anything, you know? Like, we got to – I want to emulate that, you know? I want to work as hard as he did and, and do that kind of thing. And so for me, it was Lance Armstrong when we found out about the doping and he lost all of his Tour de France titles. And, you know, it was a big deal. It was a big deal for a lot of Americans. I can tell you, it was a big deal in my household. Uh, His name is not allowed in the house anymore just because it brings up so many mixed emotions. My mom was like, that was like my mom's celebrity crush. (laughs) But uh, so like he's like in this gray area now because a lot of cyclists have come out since saying, yeah, everybody was doping. That was just kind of what we did in that era. So like, if you're the best athlete after doping and everybody's doping, like, is it okay? I don't know. So, but he's one of those guys that kind of fell from grace for me. That was like, I used to put him on this pedestal and he was perfect. You know, he was like, even with the brain cancer, he overcame everything. And then it was like, wait a second, (laughs) you know, he cheated he cheated on his wife, like, you know, these problems that were like, okay, maybe not. You know, he's still cool, still giving credit for all the work that he did to be a Tour de France winner five times in a row. Like, that's insane. But, you know, right. also. Do you think he <laughs> threw out some uh, trash cans on the track? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Because that, I mean, trash cans is a symbol of uh, great cheating for me. Exactly. Yeah. Houston Astros. <laughs> um, one... I kind of want to talk about um, it kind of came to me while we were talking about this is when it comes to church leaders. So like apostles and prophets of the past, I always think of, of Peter, right? Who was, you know, chosen to lead the church after Christ died and was given all of these great promises while Christ was on the earth. And when it came down to that crucial moment, I was like, Hey, don't, don't you know him? Aren't you, aren't you with dead Jesus guy? And he's like, Never seen the man. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and denies him three times. Like, our heroes, our leaders, they, they are human at the end of the day. And they have weaknesses. But I don't think you would take that one snippet of his life and be like, Oh, Peter didn't even believe in Jesus. So why would I even listen to him when he's telling me about how I can get to heaven by believing in Jesus if he doesn't believe it himself? Or, right. you know, like he had been told what he would need to do. But he's like, the guys ask him, hey, what should you do, Peter? He's like, I'm going fishing. I mean, you guys can do what you want to do, but I'm going fishing. So they go with him, fish all night, don't catch anything, is, is common for them when they are not doing the right stuff. And then they talk to Jesus, and Jesus is like, Peter, what are you doing? He's like, well, I want to be fishing. It's like, I told you, feed my sheep. And they like, really sorry, it. Real quick interjection there. The thing that made me laugh about that is, I don't know if you guys do this. I do this all the time. And, like, I have to, like, bring myself down. But I remember reading the Peter story many a time, you know. And I remember thinking, like, especially my mission. I was like, if Jesus himself told me that by the end of the night I'm going to deny him three times, there is no way that's happening. I am going to, if anybody asks me, I am saying yes. You know, like, I am not going to let that happen, right? But, like... It's just one of those things that, like, it was part of a prophecy and everything. But, you know, it's it's funny because, like, the strongest men that have really, like, we've seen Peter. He is a rock. We see what he did. And it's like even the strongest men will fall and at times, you know, and, and have issues even when they're told ahead of time that they're going to have the problem, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. just kind of what it is. And, like, he comes back from that, right? Uh, like you were saying, like, he was... 
he became so faithful that people would be healed by touching his shadow even like they didn't have to touch his cloak to be healed like that lady with jesus which is so crazy to think about exactly i i uh no i totally agree i think one thing is like we tend to be so judgmental of people for uh specific as aspects of their life and especially for specific choices that they've made without um considering the entire picture of of kind of like what what they've done as a person and i know for a fact that everybody has had a moment in their life that um they're completely ashamed of they did something that um they're not proud of that they wish that they could forget or that they wish that they could um, move on from and i think that's absolutely the case for everybody i feel like everybody is human everybody has made a mistake and it's unfair to judge an individual for one event or one mistake um that they've made in their life and instead you need to yeah consider that whole picture and kind of the fruit of who they are as an entire person is it is it this one moment that apparently has decided like what this entire what this person is entirely about or is it every event and the summation of kind of like everything that they've chosen to do in order to become the person that they are i think is something that we have to always um even outside of like looking at church leaders like even in people in our our regular lives I feel like that's a, a scope that we constantly have to have because I know for a fact we would never want to be judged for one mistake that we made, um, yet we're so quick to do that for everybody else. Right. And I get into discussions, um, feisty discussions, about um, <laughs> oh, no, that people who are like, how can you believe what um, like Joseph Smith or Brigham Young said when they did X, Y, and Z? was like i don't necessarily always care about it if the statement they said is true then i've taken the statement and applying that to my life and like if someone killed somebody and said hey don't kill somebody is that a bad statement it's hypocritical maybe but the statement's still true right right yeah definitely yeah and i think like even a step beyond that like for the people that you keep in your life, you know, you might want to look at the sum total of what they've done in their life or yeah. how you are affected by what they do or even just your feelings when you're around them. But I think that like one of the most important things to remember is that, you know, even if they've been a bad person for a long time, there's always that change that's a, a possibility. You know, I won't obviously if somebody is continually choosing to do wrong, they're probably going to lean that way in the end. <laughs> But there are people that that do have a, an, an insane turnaround. You know, Saul is one of the great ones that comes to my mind, like became a, an amazing prophet and apostle. And so it's just like same concept of like, we don't want to be judged for one mistake. We and we shouldn't judge for one mistake. And, you know, like for the people that we keep close to us, it's probably good to be like, hey, some total, like I see that what happens between me and you isn't great and I don't really want you in my life, but anybody can turn it around and become, you know, an amazing person very, very quickly, actually, still, so. Yeah, definitely. All right, let me pull this up here. So next, so next up here on my uh, list of notes is subject TBD. By Granticus. <laughs> is, that, is that is that? That's right. We <laughs> we kind of ended up talking about it, uh, kind of intermixed Earlier. with the uh, with the okay. Bjergsen thing. Um, That's what I figured. I just wasn't sure. I was like, I think we were kind of mixing it in with the uh, Renaissance man idea off the whole thing, but yeah. yeah. Just wanted to make sure that make sure we you were that. you were satisfied properly. Exactly. <laughs> I got to get my grant. <laughs> Your daily dose. Um, all right, so our next section is called Diamonds in the Rough. It's one of my favorite sections that we do here because it's one of the other ones that has a title. So <laughs> It's way more. Maybe you should title the other ones. Title. <laughs> title the other ones. All right, let's bring this one down here. You guys won't be able to see this again. Sorry. But okay. Just because it's easier for me. Cut off. Grant's arm a little bit. All right. This quote is stated as such. The two most powerful warriors are patience and time. 
<laughs> That's the whole quote. Are we are we guessing the origin of the quote? We are going to talk about how we feel about it first. Um, emotionally, logically. And then we will guess the origin of the quote afterward. It's fun to guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll also... going to be like, Hitler. Mussolini. <laughs> <laughs> At least he gets the concept. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> He started it off lighter. He went with like scriptures from the Quran and things in the first couple of episodes. But this one, I, I've got a strong feeling it might have some uh, Asian descent. Yeah. We'll we'll see. Uh, <laughs> that was my first thought. I know, but um, I already have my guess. I'm pretty sure. But um, let's uh, I, let's say the the quote just one more time, just to refresh. Yeah. The yeah. two most powerful warriors are patience and time. Um. I think that this is an interesting quote because I think those two warriors go hand in hand, don't they? If you think of them as warriors, patience and time. Um, you you have to wait for something to happen, so that's your patience, but that's also the time lapse of things that are going on. Um, I'm trying to think of like a, a personal life situation when that could apply. Like I'm thinking like if I'm if I'm thinking like an actual warlord saying this, you could think of the Russians saying, hey, guess what, guys? The two greatest warriors are patience and time. Guess what? The Italians are going to freeze their nuggins off in that, in that <laughs> forest. So, like, we're fine, you know? Just wait it out. So I'm trying to think of, like, a personal application that I could put in my life from that, but I do see how that is an applicable quote, something that is truthful in essence, you know? Yeah, definitely. I feel like... Um even when we talk about patience, we usually have this expectation of waiting. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it's, it's waiting as it is, um, knowing when to, yeah, like when, when is the time to strike, so to speak, as far as uh, patience isn't to say like you need to, um, yeah, like a long time has to expire before you make a decision or before you act, but just knowing that, going headfirst into a situation usually isn't going to end up well it's it's stopping to take a moment to know when is the perfect opportunity to to execute on a plan or to yeah to go forward so i i think maybe that's an important distinction to make is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a long time just as long as as it's not this hot-headed quick gut reaction um to do something yeah and there's so much you can do with patience and time it in regards to warfare, you can do your getting better at sports um, or even repenting. We all hear that like repentance takes time. And I think of when the flood came, it was one of the most merciful things God could have done. It was like, all right, you guys are messing things up way too often, too bad. I'm going to cut you off here. I want to give you more time to be able to repent and get back on the same page mm -hmm. right and yeah for a fun fact patience comes from a latin word which means to suffer so same yeah. wo same word as passion so mm, that'd be interesting so i must have a lot of patience <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's um. i'm gonna type it up for the peeps at home real quick the while well, you you guys can Guess actually, I almost didn't let you guess. Sun Tzu. Okay. <laughs> Got him. Here, what, what'd you say? Sun Tzu. It was not <laughs> Sun was, Tzu. Yeah. Oh, I boy. was, I was in Sun Tzu and um, Attila the Hun. I was kind of thinking about both of them, you know, like that Asian descent. Um, but you know, as I started giving that um, <laughs> that example of the Russians, I kind of want to stick with a Russian somewhere. So I'm gonna go like Trotsky. Stalin, someone like that. His name is Leo Tolstoy, who wrote War and Peace. Mm. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's, I actually don't know too much about his backstory, so... Yeah, he is Russian. Like is I, that... Yeah, he is Russian, so... Oh, hey! What's up? <laughs> <laughs> is he... So Count is Lev Nikolaevich. Is his... Is it... Oh, wow. 
is this quote actually in War and Peace, the book itself? I believe. Or where does this? I think it's actually in the book War and Peace. Yeah. What year was that published? War and Peace, eighteen sixty-seven. Yep. Oh wow. Yeah. So I was trying to secretly Google it while uh, no one was watching. (laughs) (laughs) I accused Zach of doing that the first week, but. Zach has been, been, been getting pretty good. He's he's gotten like <laughs> within the realm of possibility every time. Like he got the Quran right, um, and then last week we did one from uh, an emperor, uh, Nero. And he was like, I could see it being a Roman emperor, maybe. But, <laughs> and they got to Russian again, so not bad, not bad, not bad. But I was thinking Russian dictator, not a Russian writer. <laughs> pretty far off. Yeah, it's all the same in the end, right? <laughs> If you have a free thought in Russia, you're you're a, a liability. <laughs> oh man, a great series to watch. Um, if you guys haven't already, is the HBO series Chernobyl. This is, uh, uh, it's amazing. It's a it's kind of like a a short series to kind of depict the time and the era that uh, Russia was in, and how that all built up towards how. Um, the failure at Chernobyl actually happened, but it's a uh, pretty eye-opening. Not necessarily that it currently reflects what Russia stands for now. Um, not that I can speak to what, uh, as if I know what they stand for, but um, it's really interesting to see what it was like at the time for the people in Russia and um, what the government and and how they treated people is is very very interesting. Yep. Like I said, um, diamonds in the rough. Always about finding truth in unsuspecting places, regardless of the source. Because we love truth, and we want to find more of it. All right, that brings us to uh, our last fun part, which is a riddle. I was particularly busy this week, so I did steal this riddle. I didn't write this one. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's why I didn't get to try it out first. Yeah, that's why I didn't get to try it out. Um... But yeah, people need to start commenting more. I don't even know if people are watching this particular part of the video. So if you are watching this part of the video, say I watched this part of the video, and I'll know. <laughs> All right, but uh, it'll be in Latin, great. Yeah. So don't don't uh, worry too much about it. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Durcis amica ripae semper wicina profundis, suave cano musis nigro perfusa colore. Nuntia sum linguae digitis signata magistris. Quid sum. Quid sum. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. It's an old one. Don't be tempted to Google it. I'll know. Um, yeah. Did you Google it in time? <laughs> Bruh, I couldn't even Google that if I had it written out in front of me. <laughs> um, but Grant as the guest of honor do you have any uh, closing thoughts anything that you want to share with the people yeah um, I don't know I liked a lot of the topics that we, we talked about today um, and kind of a, a theme that I, I saw across it was uh, to be a well rounded person um, you need to take truth from all sources and um, be willing to experiment on things and try them out for yourself. Um, yeah, I, I think in a, a lot of times we, it's easier to to think that we can find pure enjoyment or a, a source of truth from one source, but oftentimes it takes a lot of effort on our part seeking it out and looking for it in different places. But um, whether that's being true to yourself and, and learning who you are as a person, what your hobbies and interests are, or um, what drives you professionally or even spiritually and religiously. Um, it takes acting on it and and doing your part, putting in the effort um, in order to, to truly find that truth for yourself and to find the things um, that help you and benefit you the most. Yeah, if you take that uh, fireplace basket, you can not go down to the river and you'll have the same amount of water as if you did take it to the river, but you're in two different, very different states by not doing the work. Yeah, definitely. Sure. All right, Zach. You know what time it is. Eat, Eat more, more chicken. chicken. <laughs>
Tag Team Floyd in the comments. They will, I guarantee that someone will eventually notice us and tell us to stop saying any more chicken. <laughs> that's 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 the more likely outcome. <laughs> uh, we spell ours with a with an e on the more, so exactly, exactly. There's no copyright on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks for showing up. Have a great evening, viewers at home.